Yo, what's going on guys? Welcome back to another video. Today you're going to learn all about server actions and why they're so useful in Next.js. So server actions are currently an alpha feature in Next.js. They give us a couple of benefits. They allow us to do server-side mutations without creating additional unnecessary API endpoints. It reduces the amount of client-side JavaScript and it gives us something called progressively enhanced forms, which means our forms are even more powerful without even needing JavaScript in the first place. Server actions work both inside of the Next.js server components and inside of client components. But let's jump into a demo and you'll see for yourself how useful they can be. So here I have a blank Next.js 13 project. And the first thing that we need to do is enable server actions. So it's currently an experimental feature. So I head into the next config, boom, I pop it in just like so. So it's an experimental feature. We simply enable it. And then you just want to go ahead and kickstart your server. So in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and start my server by saying npm run dev. So this is what we're going to see. It's simply a Next.js starter template. I'm going to quickly clean things up. So we have a basic starting template. So I'm going to go ahead and remove everything inside of our project so that we have nothing to distract us so let's go ahead and get rid of everything so it's simply a empty project so let's get rid of this let's go into our globals let's get rid of all of the default styling so we just have tailwind inside and then we are good with getting rid of most of our styles right here so i just want an empty project so that way i can demonstrate things for you and you can repeat it and try it for yourself so in this case we just simply have our hello world app Right, so hit save and you should see hello world in the top corner like so. So we're going to go ahead and build a product warehouse where we've got a form. It's simply going to go ahead and take a price and a description of the item. And then we can simply add the product to our database and we should be able to see it in the list of products. Sounds simple enough, right? So let's go ahead and build that. So then I'm going to go ahead and pop in a form. So a form is very simple. We simply have a form with two pieces of input. So in this case, this is our form. We have input, two text fields, and then a button to simply simply submit or in our case it's just going to be to add the product right so here is an example of a very very simple form okay so we've got our products warehouse and then we've got our two forms like so so i'm going to give it a little bit of styling to go ahead and speed things up so each of the input fields i'm going to go ahead and give a default styling like so so you can feel free to copy it we're simply using tailwind to get some nice little styling here i'm going to give both of them a placeholder so that way we've got a nice little ui in front of ourselves we've got product name price name done Okay. Now the next step is you're probably wondering, we have to actually convert this to a client component to capture whatever the user's typing in the input fields so that we can run our function, add the product, do some clever database stuff and actually add that somewhere. This is where server actions is amazing, right? It makes it so simple. We don't need to convert anything to a client component anymore. Instead, all we simply do is go ahead and provide a action. I'm also going to go ahead and style up our form. So in this case, I've just given it a little bit of flex rules and that way it looks a little bit nicer, right? Let's style out the button. Finally, boom, just like so. And there we have it. Very simple products warehouse. So the next thing is I need an API. I need a backend. So for this demo today, we're going to use something called mock API. So mock API is awesome. I'm going to go ahead and delete the resource I've currently created. All you need to do is head over to mock API io and then go ahead and create a new project i've already created this server actions demo project so i'm going to click into it and you'll get this nice little url which is going to represent a your endpoint let's create a new resource and i'm going to call this products now i'm going to go ahead and get rid of all of these fields and i'm just going to have the id which is already the object id i'm going to have the product field and i'm going to have the price field now for the auto complete i'm going to use something called faker.js this is pretty cool all you do is you basically pop in faker and then you type in commerce and now i've said that it's a product and a price and it will automatically populate these for me and the resource name is products so let's click on create and i'll show you something really cool here so i'm going to go ahead and create let's just say 50 or 49 products however you can just drag this around as much as you want and now this has actually created an api endpoint for me so in this case i'm going to go ahead and copy that paste it into my URL and do forward slash products. And this is going to do a get request to that URL. And what we'll see here is literally 59 different products because we were able to go ahead and say that we wanted 59 different things. Now, if I change this to 30, it will go ahead and update this. If I refresh and you can see we've got 30 products. So really, really cool tool for practicing things just like this. My tutorials, I like to make them interactive so you can actually try out what we're doing and you can learn for yourself. So we have a wicked API endpoint. Let's go ahead and copy that for ourselves or in fact let's copy the forward slash product so the full url let's head back over to our code and we're simply going to do a async await fetch call 
So as this is a server component, we can actually run async away at the top level. Then I'm going to go ahead and fetch the product. So I want to go ahead and simply do an await call here. We're going to fetch that URL like so. So we're going to go ahead and copy this URL. So we copy that. We pop this in like so. And then we are going to make it a get request. Now, this is by default already a get request when you have a fetch call. But what we're going to do here is actually go ahead and say just for this demo, we're going to actually say that the caching is off, right? So we're going to disable the caching because Next.js by default will cache the results. And then you might run into some issues with this demo because you might be wondering, why is my data not updating? Don't worry, I'm going to make a whole new video on Next.js caching. So I've got you back. And afterwards, I'm going to add it to this video somewhere and it'll pop up on the screen. Okay, with that done, I'm going to simply define what a product is in TypeScript. So in this case, I'm just saying the ID is optional, but we do need the product and price. When we submit that form and then i'm going to go ahead and pass the response right so in this case we can simply go ahead and get all of the products by awaiting res.json okay so this is our products like so and i'm going to simply pop it out at the bottom and then we map out through all of the different products and showcase it so let's hit save and showcase our work of art and as you can see boom we have a products warehouse with all of the items listed and as i mentioned before if you change this up go back to your page refresh we should see aha perfect okay now what's really nice about this is that i can make post requests to this uh, endpoint and we can actually see this update so this is a real example of a mock api and we can actually go ahead and interact and actually apply our server actions logic that you will learn today to actually go ahead and see if this works for itself so typically i would have to go ahead and convert this entire component or just this form i would have to extract it into a separate component and then make that a client component because i'll need to track what the user types in track what the user types in here then when they submit or click the button inside of the form i will then need to go ahead and handle some javascript which will then do a bunch of things right so, so typically we have our client so in this case this is our website so we've got the website and then you've got the our form so in this case you've got your product your price and then you've got let's just call this the submit button over here okay so imagine this is our add button over here now typically what will happen is you would fill in the product you would fill in the price and then you would click on the add button now when you click the add button typically you would be like oh, okay i need to make a post request uh, in which case i need to actually create an api endpoint right and typically you would have something like you know api forward slash product and then it would be a request that will go towards your back end and you would have to create all of this, right? So you would have to go ahead and pass in, you know, the body of the post request, make sure you handle it and sort of interact with your database over there. Then you would get the response back and then you would probably have to, you know, go ahead and add that to your local state and then list it out and so forth. It's a, it's a lot, right? It's, it's not, it's not the hardest thing to do, but it's just an extra step that you have to do every time to do things, to avoid problems such as cause and all those annoying things. So, Server Actions saves ourselves a huge amount of work. And in fact, I'm going to just show you how easy it is by demonstrating it right now. The first thing you'll notice is we actually have an action property on a form. This goes back to the PHP days, right? So we're actually going ahead and taking a step back to get ahead. <laughs> All right, so a lot of people are subjective about this, but I think it's pretty cool and, and it's got its use cases. Now, the next step is pretty simple. As we have the form data here, we actually have to give our input fields different names. So in this case, we have to say name for this one is product and this one will be simply price, okay? Now that that's done, I'm gonna grab those values from our form data like so and they may or may not be undefined. So in this case, it's good practice generally to do something like a defensive programming statement like this. So we say, if there is no product or price, just don't do anything. So it's actually a good thing to do that a lot of the time. Then we're gonna go ahead and actually build out a new product. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new product object like so. And then we're gonna go ahead and pass this to our endpoint that we've gone ahead and created on mock API. Right, so in this case, I'm going to do an await call fetch over to that API endpoint that we previously had. So that's simply going to be this endpoint right here. So we pop that in. I now need to make it a post request. And then inside the body of that, I'm going to stringify the new product. Okay. And also it's worth mentioning in JavaScript ES6, you don't have to have this repeated twice if the key and value is the same. Now, you know, little extra tip, right? 
We're also going to pass in the headers to be content type application JSON as we're going to be passing in data in the form of JSON. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Now, we're not finished yet. Whenever we're using server actions, we have to actually go ahead and add in a special little directive here called use server. By adding use server, we've now converted this function into a server action. Right, so this is now a server action, which means that it will essentially run on the server and we can use it inside of our server components. Also, it works in client components. I'll show you how to do that in a sec. So let's go ahead and give this a try. So over to my app and I'm going to pop open my inspector and you can see in the network tab, we have nothing at the moment. But in this case, I'm going to type in a MacBook Pro and we're going to say it's 1300 pounds and we're going to add the product. Now you will see that if we look inside of here, we have a post request. So this is a post request that has been sent to our backend. And if we look inside the payload, you will see that the product and the price was actually sent alongside it. So this was sent inside the body. So the MacBook Pro and 1300. Now, if we, you can see the UI didn't update, so that's a bit of an issue. But if we go to mock API and we actually inspect the data, we should now see a MacBook Pro, right? So you can see it actually went ahead and done an entire server mutation with a very, very little code. Just by including the server action, we completely eradicated the need to go ahead and actually create a new API route and all that good stuff, right? So typically you would have an API route or using the new Next.js 13 convention, you would have a route.ts file and then you would have to create a, you know, an endpoint and then you would have to have a sort of post and then you'd have to handle the response all that good stuff and uh, yeah it's not fun for anyone right so there is a time and place for api endpoints but this is honestly simplifying things so much i'm here for it now we as i mentioned before it was not updating the ui that's a bit annoying that's a bit of a problem right so how can we actually go ahead and fix that well very simply actually so when we did the initial fetch we can now actually add something called tags so so we simply go ahead pop in a new tag and we, this is simply an array of different tags str string tags that we can pass into our fetch call and these tags are really cool because what we can do is inside of our server action all we need to do is after we've done our server mutation and we want the ui to be updated is revalidate tag this is being imported from next cache and then what we do is we simply pass in the tag that we want to go ahead and revalidate so using that one line of code if we hit save we can now go back to our app and let's go ahead and just do a little refresh to prove to you that everything is you know fresh we've even disabled the cache i'm going to type in let's just say an iphone 15 right and then we say uh, price name that we did 999 and let's add a product and as you can see boom Ah, it did it, right? So that was actually completely streamed in uh, from a server component, which is really, really nice, right? So that means that we didn't have to go ahead and refresh the page or do any kind of, you know, annoying things like that. All it did was essentially it burst our cache and it refetched this, right? By basically saying that after this fetch occurred, we now revalidate that tag, which means that any fetch call which was labeled with that tag needs to be refetched. So in this case, it's not going to refetch all of the different fetch calls. It would individually only refetch this one. So it's actually quite an efficient way of working on your page. Now, as you can see, this works perfectly. So we can go ahead and say iPhone 16 and I can pop in one, two, three, add a product and boom, just like that, we have a perfectly working form. And what's really cool about this is it supports something called progressive enhancement out of the box. This means that if your JavaScript was disabled for whatever reason, it will actually operate and it will work. This is similar to how PHP used to work back in the day, but now it's supported out of the box for Next.js 13, which is pretty damn cool. Now, the next cool thing to know about server actions are that they are composable. Now, what does that even mean? It means basically in a nutshell that we can, we don't have to have this function inside of here, right? Typically, I wanna keep my functions nice and clean. This is not really that clean. So I'm gonna go ahead and neaten this right now by moving it out into a separate folder of its own. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new folder called actions. And this doesn't need to be called actions. You can call it whatever you want. I'm just simply going to call it my server actions folder. So .ts. And then I'm going to go ahead and copy or actually
actually, I'm going to cut my function from here, go into my server actions and paste it. So in order to get this working, we're simply going to move the use server call to the top of the file. And all this is doing is it essentially says that any function beneath that use server is now a server action. Okay. And then all we can do is we can export that function and use it elsewhere. Things like, you know, our type definitions. If you really want to make things neat, you can go ahead. And what I would recommend is you actually sort of export this, create a new typings file. So in this case, typings.d.ts file, and then you pop it in there. And now you've got a much simpler code base and you simply import it when you need it. Okay, so as you can see, that works really nice. We can get rid of that. We can simply import from our server actions like so. Hit save, go back over here. We can do the same thing. We can import from our typings and we can import our next cache revalidate tag. Just like that, we've now shifted our, our server action outside and we can have several server actions in the same file. Really cool, right? There's minimal code and we have a full round trip. We can actually have a server mutation. We have a fully functioning form and we have the ability to revalidate the page. Now, that's not the only way to revalidate. We can actually do a revalidate tag based on the tag or we can actually revalidate based on the path. So if we was to revalidate the home screen, for example, in this case, this would revalidate the entire page. Now, why might you not want to do that? Well, the fact is, is that let's imagine I had several different fetch calls what would then happen is it would force all of those fetch calls to actually refetch and that can be a bit of an annoying problem depending on if you've set up your caching rules correctly right so i would recommend that you actually just use tags that way you're specifically saying if this happens then revalidate only these products or only these students or users or whatever your tags are and it would only go ahead and bust that piece of cache and then refetch it accordingly now the next thing i mentioned was it's possible to use this inside of client components so let's go ahead and show you a nice little example of how we can do that. So I'm going to create a add product button component. So I'm going to create a new folder. So this is a typical flow inside of an app. We would have a components folder and then we would have something like this. We'll have an add product button component. So in this case, add product dot TSX. And inside of here, I have a component. So we have our React functional component like so. And this component is going to look something like this. So it's going to be a button right? Instead of the div, it's simply going to be a button and it's going to have a add product. Okay. And we're going to convert this entire component to a client component like so. So let's go ahead and import this into our app. So at the top of our products warehouse, let's simply just make our life easier and have it right at the top. We're going to have an add product button. And this is just going to add a static MacBook Pro of a specific price purely to demonstrate the purpose of what we're trying to do here. Okay. So if we want to use it inside of a client component, firstly, we would have to shift all of our server actions into their own file with a uh, use server call at the top. Okay, so that's the first step. That way we can import it into our client components if we need it. The second step is use something called the use transition hook. So as we are now a client component, we can use our hooks. So let's go ahead and pop it in and we're going to import the use transition hook from React. This will give us two things from the array destructured values. We've got is pending and start transition. The code is a little bit ugly here, but I promise you it will make a little bit of sense once we actually play with it. The whole point is, is that we can actually now call it. So if I want to go ahead and say on click, all I would do is when I click this button, I just need to go ahead and start the transition. And what you want to do is you basically want to invoke it with a inner function. And that inner function is actually the, pro the uh, server action that we're actually going to call. So in this case, I'm going to be calling the add product to database function. Now this is complaining because the add product to database function actually required the form data. So what I'm going to do here just for demonstration purposes is I'm going to go ahead and create a brand new form data uh, item at the top right here. So we're going to create a new form data item. I'm going to simply add in a MacBook Pro of a certain price and I'm simply going to pass in that form data object, right? Obviously you can do a lot more complicated examples. This is purely to demonstrate the point. I'm going to add in a bit of basic styling so that way that button's nice and fixed in the bottom right hand side and it's a nice little red button or green button in fact. And then we're going to go ahead and hit save. But you might notice this is pending. This is pretty cool because when we actually go ahead and do that server mutation, you saw that there was a post request that got fired off. While that is happening, what if we want to update the UI? Well, we can actually use the is pending. Okay, so it's pretty handy. Let's go ahead and actually, do, instead of saying add product, I want to say something like, if it's pending, then I'm going to go ahead and say adding. Otherwise, it's going to go ahead and say something like add MacBook Pro. 
Okay, simple as we're gonna hit save. And now let's go ahead and see what this looks like inside of our app. So we've imported it at, at this point here. So I'm gonna go back to my code, refresh, and we should see an add MacBook Pro button right here. Now, what's really cool about this is this is a client component. So it's re rendered on the client after the server component has rendered. And then we can go ahead and click on this. And as you'll see, when I click it, if I go ahead and hide this now, you'll see that we have the exact same interaction, but we get a UI update at the same time. So look, add MacBook Pro, it tells us it's adding it. Then it goes ahead and adds it. And we had the same thing. Form data got you know added into our post request and it was a 200 sent back, right? And then they revalidated the tags and everything was perfect. So as you can see, this is how we can use it inside of a client component and we can get an update um, as to what it's doing at that point in time. So we actually get the is pending state and then you can use that to reflect any UI changes that you wish. Now it's worth mentioning that you can actually add in more than one action inside of a form. So in this case, we've got the form action here. By default, it will trigger off the server action add product database. Well, in that case, it's very simple. We can actually do it with things like input fields where the type is image, and we can go ahead and use the form action property to go ahead and create a new action. So you would have to create this submit, out action, uh, submit image action exactly the same way we created add product to database. But when you select the image, it will go ahead and actually fire that off instead. It's worth giving the documentation a nice little read. So in this case, in the Next.js docs, you can actually see it works with input type submit, input type image, and it works on a button as well. So in this case, the default form action was handle submit, but if you went ahead and submitted it via the input type image, so in that case, when you select on, you know, click on select image and it pops up with the little window, it will go ahead and actually trigger this server action. Now, remember I showed you these are composable, so you can shift them out to keep things clean, but it's always worth mentioning that you can go ahead and do this. Now, I do want to mention an important note as well. Whenever you go ahead and actually use a server action inside of a client component, it will actually go ahead and get rid of that progressive enhancement if you use the transition hook, right? So the use transition hook. The reason for that is because it's actually requiring JavaScript to do a few of the clever things that it needs to do. For example, keep track of if it's pending and so forth. So remember, progressive enhancement means that it essentially works if JavaScript is even disabled. So basically at the raw, rawest level you can imagine. But if you want to know, you know, if it's pending and have that nice little interactive UI, for example, when we were messing around with things, when I click this, that little adding update, then you're going to need to go ahead and it will actually disable it by default. It does state this inside of the documentation as well. So it's always worth giving it a little bit of a read inside of the documentation, okay? Now the final thing to know is that you can actually save this and uh, keep your progressive enhancement if you don't use the use transition at all, right? So it's actually fairly easy to do so. So let's say we weren't going to use that and we still want to use the server action. Well, in that case, you can just simply do it like this, right? You can simply go ahead and get rid of this, get rid of this. We can go ahead and use it like so. And where we have our um, on click, so in this case, let's go ahead and get rid of this. Let's just type in uh, add, for example, like so. And then let's go back to our application, hit refresh. And now you'll see that we've got an add button. And when I click the add button, we still get the same behavior. As you can see, this is a client component. It's using a server action, but we keep the progressive enhancement because we don't really care about the UI being updated. So that way it allows it to basically run even if the JavaScript was disabled for whatever reason. Now, if you notice when I click on add, there's a slight little delay between the time when I clicked it and when it actually shows on the screen. This is because there's that post request being sent out and then we have to wait for the response. Then it revalidates and so forth all of that happens in a round trip fashion so if you don't want to have that delay you can simply go ahead into the docs and check out the use optimistic hook this is basically going to allow you to have optimistic updates which basically means when you click it it appears as if it's instant when really it's actually you're guessing what's going to happen first and then that provides the local state and then it does the back end call behind the scenes so i'm not going to explain that today but if you do want me to make a video on the use optimistic hook be sure to drop a like if this video gets enough likes you know what I'll do. I'll create a video all about it to explain it to you. With that said, this was your deep dive into server actions in Next.js 13.4. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you found it useful and I hope you understand now how you can use server actions in both client and server components, how you can get your UI to update if you want to see what the current progress of the state is and how it saves you a lot of time as you no longer need to go ahead and create your separate API routes just to make a simple server mutation. Remember, this is currently an alpha, so things are likely to change. Things are likely to be 
you know a little bit different by the time you may be watching this video so make sure to always go ahead and refer to the documentation as well as these videos and don't forget if you want more content like this like comment and subscribe and as always guys i will see you in the next one peace